Thanks, Alexandre, and uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers uh, for inviting me and uh, for giving me an opportunity to share, uh, you know, what we uh, did and uh, how we used the correlative light electron microscopy, which is a fantastic technology uh, with which one can uh, see uh, the structure in a uh, uh, living cell and then uh, see how this structure look like under the electron microscope and make its reconstruction with a really, really high uh, uh, resolution. So, if we uh, look back in time, okay, uh, correlative light electron microscopy, or CLAM, could be divided in uh, uh, two uh, periods or two stages, okay? One is uh, uh, from uh, 60s or even earlier, then people were correlating just uh, uh, things uh, uh, looking at the same field using uh, uh, light microscope and then uh, electron microscope because there is a opportunity to make thin section, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, semi thin section from resin block, look at the structure of the uh, field using light microscope, see overall. Uh, features and then f exactly from the same area, okay, make an ultra thin section and take them to electron microscope and see how things are organized there. And certain research benefited from this uh, opportunity. However, from uh, maybe a new millennium and on, uh, correlative uh, light electron microscopy claim was uh, uh, re related to the uh, development of uh, GFP and it's kind of GFP based super resolution video microscopy uh, which allows you to track uh, the structure of interest in living cell and then I take a snapshot of uh, its uh, ultra structure using electron microscope which gives a kind of super resolution light electron microscopy. Okay, so uh, as I uh, noted, uh, everything was uh, triggered by uh, GFP revolution in cell biology field. Okay, and I was a kind of uh, a witness of this uh, resolution because I was in uh, the lab of Jennifer Lippincon Schwartz, uh, who implemented uh, uh, GFP technology in membrane trafficking field. Uh, here you can see a video uh, which was made uh, uh, by John Presley, my colleague at the NIH when I was in Jennifer's lab, a published paper in the Nature. The video shows how protein uh, VSVG, so it's transmembrane type 1 cargo protein, fused with GFP traffics from endoplasmic reticulum with diffuse network okay, in the cell to the Golgi, the central uh, bright structure. You can see number of uh, transport intermediates and dynamic structures moving from cell periphery to the Golgi and it was uh, 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 noted that we use microtubules, high speed, uh, directionality, of so this give a huge amount of new information, okay, and one big doc in the field, Hugh Pelham in News and Views for this uh, paper wrote that a few moments of time-lapse video were enough to resolve the issue that years of microscopy on fixed cells have failed to settle. Okay, so it was really, really a big breakthrough in, in, in cell biology field. However, okay, the same uh, uh, news and views from Hugh told that unfortunately like microscopy cannot achieve sufficiently high resolution, so spectacular though it is, GFA technology has its limits because Nobody uh, know uh, how these uh, structures look like under electron microscope because resolution is not enough. Okay, so e we were thinking about uh, uh, you know addressing this issue, and uh, we were studying trafficking from uh, Golgi to a cell uh, surface. Okay, using the same protein VSVG. And uh, when we look at, at uh, uh, you know, these uh, tiny spots, okay, moving in the cell, we always wondered how they would look like under electron microscope. Why simple vesicles, train of vesicles, or something more complex, tubular, circular, vesicular, clusters, etc., etc. So, uh, for these, we would need to develop a specific, uh, this is much better, okay, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> For this, we would need to develop a specific uh, 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 technology, kind of uh, Star Wars, which would uh, 
join a resolution force of electron microscopy with the ability of GFP to highlight dynamics uh, uh, processes in, in the cell. Okay, and um, uh, actually the principle of uh, uh, such technology, of LAM, would be to characterize a dynamic process in a living cell. Then, once you characterize that you have particular interest, okay, in uh, some stages of this process, like formation of vesicle or fusion with plasma membrane, okay, or transition through the uh, cytoplasm. So uh, then uh, one would take two pictures of the same structured particular stage of the process using uh, uh, GFP light microscopy and another uh, at VM level and integrate the information. So uh, you will ask what, what are advantages? Advantage is resolution because for these cells observed in the uh, living cell, you would have an ultrastructural information. Second is reference space or structure around the, uh, uh, the structure of your interest. For example, here you can see this guy who, you know, moved in uh, living cells uh, were taken, okay, so it's labeled with HRP. However, we can see also using them the structures nearby, okay, so one can have uh, an idea about interaction of structure of your interest with uh, the rest of the cell, other organelles. And finally, uh, you know, uh, we know also the history of this structure before the cell was fixed. If we would work with uh, fixed cells, one would say, oh, so I don't know whether it's derived from a Golgi or from a plasma membrane, okay? Here one can say, okay, it's derived from a Golgi, so it's Golgi to plasma membrane carrier. <laughs> okay, so how it's done in practice? Uh, one have to grow cells on uh, uh, cover slip with coordinated grid, okay? Because this allows you to track the cell of interest through different stages of a procedure. Uh, we transfected these cells with a uh, construct uh, of interest carrying fluorescent protein, then observed in living cell uh, the structure of interest, and then uh, usually we uh, were convinced that we should convert GFP signal into something electron dense, which should be gold or peroxidase. This uh, helps you to find the structure of interest in the thin sections. So after immunolabeling uh, against GFP or some epitope of protein of your interest, we will embed in cell in the resin. Okay, here you can see uh, here were the cells. We attach the resin block. Uh, then we trim pyramids. Okay, and the pyramid okay could be as uh, as small as single cell. Okay. Uh, then serial sections are produced, uh, picked on the slot and analyzed under electron microscope with subsequent uh, 3D uh, reconstruction of a structure of interest. Okay. Here I would like to show you one of the first movies which we made. You can see here Golgi. Okay, the cell was kept at 20 degrees. Uh, uh, to accumulate material in the Golgi area. Uh, once it's shifted to 32 uh, uh, degrees, uh, the proteins start to leave Golgi and move to the plasma membrane. So let me try to show the movie again. Now you start to see here how uh, the transport intermediate will move from the Golgi to cell periphery once the cells were warmed up okay, to permissive temperature. Okay, we started to observe it with very obsolete uh, and primitive meridian confocal microscope. Okay, here the cell was fixed and uh, uh, after fixation, we stained it with uh, antibodies against VSVG using immunoperoxidase protocol. Uh, you can see that uh, peroxidase staining recapitulates what we saw uh, with GFP. Here is Golgi, here is transport carrier of our interest. The cell was found on coordinated grid and cut in serial sections. And here is panoramic view uh, from uh, uh, this uh, serial section, I think. And you can see that uh, uh, that time we were making photos, okay, <laughs> and stitching them by, by scotch to see the overall uh, you know, a big structure of uh, cell of interest. 
Here you can see in EM image of low magnification the Golgi, which corresponds to the Golgi spot here, and the transport carrier of our interest, which were moving from a Golgi to the plasma membrane. So we uh, zoomed in this area in our section and found that it's pretty big, more than one micron structure, which were bumped into mitochondrion. Okay, so when it was stopped, uh, it was a physical barrier basically. And uh, uh, then in serial sections, we uh, observed this structure at higher magnification, made the 3D resolution. So it's not a simple vesicle, it's like we were drawing uh, the textbooks. It's a pleomorphic structure, which is pretty big. It could carry a lot of material, and you will see then why it's important. We uh, performed CLAM also uh, in other cells and other occasions, always the structures which we were detecting for, uh, mm, you know, this type of cargo protein, this VGGFP, or tubular, tubular saccula, uh, rather than simple uh, vesicles, uh, as it was uh, thought before. However, then the reviewers, okay, as it always happens, said, okay, but do you guys know that these structures which you monitored in themselves are real uh, transport carriers? So, they derive from the Golgi, but do we then deliver material to the plasma member? Do we fuse with plasma member? Or is just, you know, pieces of the Golgi going around? Okay, that could be a case. Okay. This was a challenging task, but uh, we tried to address it. So this is a, a living cell. The fluorescence is inverted. So you can imagine uh, what, uh, what is uh, uh, black here should be bright on, on the black field. So we started to observe the movement of one transport carrier the, towards plasma membrane. Okay, here it's indicated by arrowhead. And uh, we tried to fix the cell at the moment when this carrier started to fuse with the plasma membrane. Okay, this was extremely tricky, but we did it a couple uh, of times, of three times probably. And uh, uh, our reasoning was uh, following. Okay. So we uh, uh, fixed uh, this structure during uh, the fusion with the plasma membrane. So if the fusion occurs, the uh, extra domain of VSVG, okay, which uh, uh, is in uh, this transport intermediate, should be accessible for antibodies against ectodomain of VSVG added from outside the cell, okay? So what we did, we didn't permeabilize this cell for immunolabeling, but added antibody to the cell uh, from outside uh, and uh, observed that something, some positivity was here, okay? Uh, so we had uh, these uh, two microvilla uh, spots, okay, near uh, the fusion intermediate, and uh, actually we used them for CLEM as a landmarks and found that indeed the uh, structure which we observed uh, in light microscope and appeared to be a fusion of a carrier with the plasma membrane was uh, uh, labeled, okay? This means that the transport intermediate derived to the Golgi uh, really reached the plasma membrane and established the uh, contact with it and fused. Otherwise, uh, antibodies uh, against uh, ectodomain of VSVG wouldn't enter it, okay? So at this point, we uh, proved that uh, really uh, uh, these transport structures, which are very different from uh, what thought uh, in the textbook, vesicles, okay, were uh, carrying bulk flow of the proteins from the Golgi to the plasma matter. Yeah, this was a kind of achievement because if you look at the two pictures from textbook Molecular Biology of a Cell of 2003 and 2008, okay, uh, this part has changed. Instead of simple vesicles, the constitutive trafficking uh, from the TGN to the plasma membrane was depicted to occur with uh, uh, pretty large uh, uh, structures. And this makes sense. So if you have to make a bulk, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the passengers between two continents, okay, you would use jumbo jet, okay, just one jumbo jet for 400, let's say, uh, passengers, instead of using maybe 30, 40 uh, private jets, which would carry 10 passengers. This, this makes sense, okay, so 
for cell economy, it's uh, much easier to use bigger transport carriers if you have to transport a larger number of protein. Okay. So uh, uh, we were pretty satisfied uh, with uh, this achievement, and here Clem really showed its potential. And uh, we also were happy that uh, with uh, uh, our uh, method developed was uh, uh, taken uh, well by community, and after 2000, the use of Clem uh, significantly increased. As it's revealed also by number of publications per year. So our friend Paul Vercade said that uh, the new era of CLEM more or less started with the paper by Polishuk et al. in uh, GCB, in which they combined GFP light microscopy imaging with immunolabeling for GFP for him. We, uh, since it was tour de force, okay, correlative, we didn't think that it will be so popular, okay, but now uh, more and more labs uh, use it and uh, it became kind of even routine technology in a certain way, although it's uh, very technically demanding. But I would like to uh, shift the gears a little bit, okay, and uh, to uh, show you how uh, CLAMP could be used, uh, uh, not necessarily with uh, GFP imaging, but with other, uh, for other tasks which would require uh, its implementation. So one of these is validation of uh, light uh, microscopy super resolution methods okay so how you validate whether your super resolution microscopy is good enough to see something okay at light microscopy the control is electron microscopy there is no way to to to, to control it in, in in a different manner then sometimes you have a, a, some construct or some uh, uh, you know uh, um, viruses which uh, result in uh, low transfection efficiency and here, uh, using CLAM, one can find the cell of interest if you have 1% of cell, and I will show you the case now. Uh, CLAM could help to see the cell of your interest. Or otherwise, it could be a, a rare phenotype or structure in the heterogeneous cell population. Okay? So, as regarding uh, low uh, transfection efficiency, I would like to uh, show an example which is uh, related to very hot topics, SARS-CoV-2, okay? I'm sure that Mirko will explain and much better the life cycle of uh, SARS-CoV-2, but here, just in few words, then uh, a viral particle, okay, enters the cell and undergoes uncoating. Its uh, RNA uh, is uh, translated in a couple of polypeptides which then uh, uh, cleave it, okay, into non-structural proteins. Non-structural proteins are uh, needed to organize uh, replication uh, transcription centers and replication organelles, where actually replication of genomic uh, uh, RNA of virus occurs as well as a transcription of uh, subgenomics uh, uh, RNAs, okay? These subgenomic RNAs then are needed for biosynthesis of structural proteins, which are called spike proteins, <laughs> one of the most famous, and, and others, and develop M and N. Uh, they participate in, uh, you know, organization and biogenesis of viral particles in the R uh, to Golgi intermediate compartment or ergic, and then uh, viral particles move through a secretory pathway to uh, exit from a cell and be released. So this is very brief. We were particularly interested in uh, non-structural proteins, which participate in the generation of replication organelles, so called double membrane vesicles. And uh, our attention was focused on NSP3, NSP4, and NSP6. Why? Because they are membrane proteins, and we thought that may, may be involved in remodeling of intracellular membranes for virus need. Okay, so uh, we know from the previous studies in SARS-CoV-1, okay, that NSP3 and 4, uh, when trans, uh, transfected into the cells, could uh, uh, induce generation of uh, double membrane vesicles, okay, uh, which reminiscent of uh, replication virus organelle, which is also double membrane vesicle. So here you can see the gold labeling of uh, the cell co-transfected with NSP3 and 4. The gold particles recognize NSP3 and stays mainly on the double membrane vesicles, which are shown here uh, with uh, a normal electron microscopy without labeling. Okay. 
So what happens when we transfect NSP6? NSP6 was kind of mystery, okay? So when we transfected the uh, uh, cells and started to look at the gold labeling, it was concentrated in a couple of places. One on very thick membranes, which seems to be in continuity with endoplasmic reticulum. And the other structures uh, were from the similar thick members, uh, membranes, sorry, uh, but uh, kind of circular. Here you can see uh, the same uh, structures without labeling. Here you can see uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which continue in these uh, thick cosmophilic, like we said, zippered membranes, and here the round structure. So using EM tomography, so like tomography which goes through a thick section, we found that uh, uh, actually these thick membranes are always uh, in continuity with the air. You can see here, for example, this round, okay, this round structure, but where it starts, it starts from here, where uh, it's uh, linked to endoplasmic reticulum. And even uh, um, this NSP6 protein was capable of uh, generating such structures uh, uh, at the nuclear envelope, his nucleus, nuclear pore, and you see how it seals uh, nuclear envelope. Okay. Now, uh, the higher uh, uh, magnification and zoom in the areas of transition between endoplasmic reticulum and uh, this uh, uh, strange NSP6 positive membrane revealed that basically uh, there are areas where uh, the endoplasmic reticulum lumen collapses and the two membranes of it are attached to each other, stitched or zippered, like we said. Okay, so we call this one zippered ER. Okay. Now, what happens if you transfect NSP3, 4, and 6? Okay. This is what happens. Okay. You have two cells of 100, okay, which express all three proteins, okay, at more or less, uh, uh, you know, similar levels. So uh, this is clear cut case for clan, okay. So you wouldn't like to make pellet of a cell and then try to find uh, these uh, two guys, okay. Instead, you go uh, to uh, hunt for them, okay, for these two cells. Uh, we did exactly the same, so uh, you can see these two a couple of cells expressing uh, NSP3, 4, and NSP6. If we zoom inside one of these cells, we will see that NSP3 and NSP4 always uh, stay uh, together in these magenta structures, okay? And uh, nearby we have NSP6 structures, which are then uh, correlated with EM images. So if you look at the NSP3 for positive structure magenta here, they correspond to cluster of double membrane vesicles. Then nearby you have uh, this NSP6 GFP, okay, here, here, which stay always close, okay, and sometimes connected. Why connected? Because by electron microscopy, electron tomography, we then demonstrate that with this zippered membrane, okay, zippered domain, is connected with the double membrane vesicle on one side, and with a normal endoplasmic reticulum on the other side, making a kind of linker or connector between normal ER and double membrane vesicles. Here's 3D reconstruction shown with, you can see a cluster of double membrane vesicles with zipper DR in green and normal ER in, in yellow. Okay. So uh, these uh, uh, resemble uh, or remind a lot the organization of uh, uh, replication organ in uh, 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 virus infected cells, which were characterized by Mirko. So we also saw these uh, uh, highly osmiophilic zippered membranes, okay? They call them connectors. So these connectors are very similar uh, to what we saw in uh, our case with NSP6. And uh, here we have double membrane vesicles, double membrane vesicles, connector, connector, and normal ER, yeah, normal yeah, here. So just with three protein, we kind of, uh, uh, let's say, reconstructed membrane remodeling, which occurs uh, with uh, virus infection. It's, it's really amazing. The three proteins do that, okay? Now, uh, why these uh, zipper at the domains are needed? We have several hypotheses, some of them proved, some not yet. And we think that uh, uh, such 
uh, zipper domains, I needed to limit the access of unwanted molecules to replication organelles. So you don't want to go, uh, uh, you don't want that yak quality control proteins go into replication center and induce innate immunity, okay? This is number one. Number two is uh, that uh, um, these structures could support uh, biogenesis of uh, replication organelle double membrane vesicles by uh, allowing uh, a specific and selective supply of specific lipid and proteins, uh, as we think. Okay? Uh, but it's not only common so for SARS CoV, also other viruses uh, use ER connected replication organelles for uh, uh, you know uh, replication of uh, RNA and its uh, uh, transcription. Okay, so uh, if we would uh, uh, think about development of clam technologies, okay, we uh, uh, could uh, imagine several areas, okay, and uh, there were also developments in these areas. One is automated tracking, okay, so to track with M cell all the different. Uh, stages of clamp procedure, combination with advanced light microscopy methods like, uh, you know, STED or SIEM or something like uh, that, which would allow better resolution at the level of uh, light microscopy. Then it would be nice and there uh, are already probes which are both fluorescent and can be easily converted into the, something uh, uh, detectable by electron microscopy. Cryofixation comes uh, in mind that it's an uh, advantage for electron microscopy to use cryo or a chemical fixation for a number of uh, uh, you know, applications. And uh, finally, now uh, in electron microscopy, we have uh, possibilities to go through really large volumes of uh, cells and organelles and uh, with new technologies. And we uh, actually uh, have uh, this opportunity um, and have to combine uh, it with JFP uh, uh, imaging or with light microscopy for certain tasks. So I would like to uh, show you how new uh, technology, uh, FIBSAM, okay? Let's say, imagine that uh, you, you can go through very, very large uh, volume uh, of a cell, okay? And uh, this actually uh, uh, allows you to uh, analyze uh, uh, pretty, pretty uh, significant volumes, like uh, several microns, okay? Let me check if I will have, uh, uh, you know, movie here. Yeah, okay, this works, okay. So the, the movie works like this, okay? You see, okay? So you go through really, really big volume of SL with pretty good resolution, okay? I will not go in detail how the methodology works, okay? But it allows you to uh, take an image of an entire cell, okay? Or its portion, okay? So it could be uh, even hundreds of microns, okay? It depends what you would like to see, okay? So, and we applied these, okay, in genetic disorders. My lab studies Wilson disease. Okay, which is uh, an inherited disorder of copper metabolism with a number of uh, uh, symptoms which related mainly to toxic accumulation of copper in the liver. And uh, disease is induced by mutation in uh, uh, ATP CNG gene, which encodes copper transporter, copper ATPase, which pump copper away from the uh, cytosol across the membrane. So then uh, uh, ATP 7B is mainly expressed in the liver, which is central organ in copper homeostasis. Uh, liver receives copper, dietary copper from portal circulation. And in hepatocytes, it's imported inside the cell through CTR1 channel and ferried by atox chaperone to ATP 7B. And ATP 7B resides mainly in trans-Golgi network, okay? And it has two tasks. It uh, loads uh, uh, copper on uh, ceruloplasmin, a copper carrying protein which uh, distributes copper to peripheral tissues. Okay, and copper there is needed as a uh, cofactor for many enzymes participating in really important uh, 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 processes, like for example, uh, COX-4 uh, in mitochondria needs it for respiration. Okay, then uh, if uh, copper exceeds the cellular need. ATP 7B uh, uh, goes to lysosomes, okay, where it sequesters coppers, 
and presumably also participates in copper excretion to the bile. Okay? When the protein is mutated, uh, copper uh, accumulates in the hepatocytes and liver, induce redox damage and cell death. Okay? And then all symptoms of Wilson disease. So, uh, in this context, it's extremely important to know how trafficking of ATP 7B happens. Because uh, when, uh, before we came in the field, it was a uh, uh, controversy whether ATP 7B moves from uh, Golgi to uh, endolysosomal compartment where it sequesters copper, and then it's end point of its trafficking, and then copper somehow is excreted into a bile. Or it goes to lysosome, sequester copper, and then also divided to canalicular uh, domain of a hepatocyte where participate in copper excretion into a biochemical. Okay, this would be uh, much significantly important because in this case the protein can directly pump copper from a cell into the bile. Okay, not only sequester it into lysosomes. So, to discriminate between uh, two possibilities, we used HEPG2 cells, which can be polarized, and biliary or canalicular cyst, okay, analog of biliary ducts, can be generated in these cells, uh, uh, which undergo polarization. Uh, the uh, advantages that they are hepatic uh, origin undergo polarization, and they express endogenous ATP7B, which can be tracked by antibodies, okay, at low copper. ATP cell B resides in the trans Golgi network. <laughs> when you add copper, ATP cell B move outside of the Golgi, label it with TGM46, and uh, goes to peripheral structures. What are these peripheral structures? Uh, so uh, we know that they could be uh, lysosomes, and we made, uh, made labeling for CD63, and uh, uh, canalicular areas or canalicular domains of polarized cells, which can be labeled with MDR GFP. So at the low copper, ATP7B, which is here in red, stays in the gold and do not colocalize with a lysosomal or canalicular marker. You add copper for two hours and you start to see that ATP7B colocalizes with the lysosomes, which start to cluster around canalicular area. And uh, later, ATP7B is delivered together with lysosomal marker to canalicular domain. Okay. So we said, okay, so we have a pathway. But, uh, you know, as always, uh, it happens, reviewers say, okay, guys, you have to demonstrate that uh, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, kind of occasional overlap of smaller uh, structures in the uh, canalicular area, but there could be vesicles accumulated, not necessarily that's delivery of protein occurs. So you don't have enough resolution with simple confocal microscopy. So this was case for CLEM again. So here we have uh, uh, actually um, cells where we label it ATP7B in red or with secondary antibodies which have both fluorochrome and uh, gold particles, okay? And uh, we have a structure of our interest uh, in GFP, MDR GFP. So as you can see from a field of view, it's not that many cells contain these structures, okay? but uh, this was why we used CLEM, otherwise we probably opted for just a normal uh, immunoelectron microscopy. So uh, the cells of our interest were uh, visualized using uh, uh, a confocal microscopy. We see some yellow, which would indicate in principle that ATP7B reaches the canalicular domains. However, we wanted to go to the uh, uh, you know, electron microscopy level. For this, uh, we uh, started to perform CLAM. You can see here a letter K, okay, which uh, indicates where the uh, area of our interest is. This is our cell. Here you have some tips. Here you have some tips, canalicular domains. <laughs> this is a, a scanning electron microscopy image of a uh, cell island. And we zoomed in uh, here and uh, what we did here with uh, this FIBSEM focus on uh, beam scanning electron microscopy, we cut the cell okay, across with a uh, 30 nanometer distance. And why we needed uh, uh, to uh, do this? Because this structure is really, really huge. 
it's uh, several microns up to uh, 12 microns okay and we wanted to see whether gold particles uh, associated with atp7 be uh, present inside this structure here you can see the cell of interest okay uh, and I will start the movie. Uh, you can see how we go through a cell. At a certain point, you start to see here number of microvilli which usually reside in the canalicular domain. You can see tight junctions between two cells forming this canalicular area. And actually, what you can also see is multiple gold particles present on microvilli and on this canalicular cyst indicating that indeed ATP7B reaches the canalicular domain of hepatocytes. So in brief, uh, this shows you uh, the canalicular area, it's here, okay, you can see it's in green. Uh, you have gold particles inside indicating that ATP7B is there. Now, uh, this means that indeed protein can be delivered to canalicular domain and pump copper inside, which uh, allows it to uh, get rid of excess copper and detoxify its rapidly. Okay? This is, was really important for understanding how the disease related protein works in normal cells. Okay, with this, I would like to wrap up my talk okay, and thank the people who, uh, you know, participated in the uh, you know, development uh, of uh, CLEM technology. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank Alexander Sasha Mironov, okay, uh, who now is uh, in IFOM because it was his idea. Okay? He said, once, once he saw GFP, he said, we have to now connect it to electron microscopy. And we worked hardly with him okay, to do this, make it possible. Then a number of uh, collaborators uh, from uh, um, Ex Mario Negri Institute, who moved in different uh, places. Uh, then uh, Jennifer Lippincourt Schwartz and Juan Bonifacino from uh, uh, NIH. I also used uh, uh, a lot of uh, correlative there, and they were very supportive for in, in, in its implementation in their research. Then uh, funding, okay, and uh, different microscopy companies which helped us with different tools. Uh, for development of uh, claim protocols and you for your attention.